tous les autres en ont. Enfin, je vais voir. Uh, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Hi. As a person, please. Oh. Si j'ai une question, j'ai... are still ongoing. This? Yeah. If I try to, no, it's... Hello? You can try this. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, so I think what, what the situation is, is we can't have two mics on at the same time. 
w yeah, which so it creates feedback, which is maybe uh, a good thing. So. <laughs> Um, thank you for bearing with us uh, with, with the delay. Um, I, I want to introduce this panel on um, gender issues and democratic participation, reclaiming ICTs for a humane world. My name is Sheetal Kumar and I am a program lead at Global Partners Digital, which is an organization based in the UK but working globally. And this panel combines uh, two... Uh, what if I just don't use this? It's not because I'm being lazy, it's because we've had changes. Makeup. Actions and then. Okay. I think um, it wouldn't be an IGF without technical difficulties, so we would be robbed of that, um, that joke if, <laughs> if we weren't having some sort of issues. So we'll start right away, um, and I'll ask, I'll, I'll turn to um, the panelists on, the, on the, the side here to introduce themselves. Can you allow me to just yes. to present like a testing session one, just to tell you of course. Can I use the mic or not? Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, so welcome to Paris because first we're a French organization so we're glad to welcome you all. Uh, we're, um, Jamais Sans Elle was launched two years ago uh, basically by men uh, who decided not to attend any forum or uh, panels in which they were, there will be no single woman involved. So, and basically I think we succeeded because personally uh, I, I do not see any more panel without women. I think in two years it changes a lot. It's not just because of us, of course. But that was our first uh, um, commitment, was just a simple commitment. And the organization evolved towards a much broader um, engagement, which was to um, involving gender equality uh, in every kind of fields, businesses, uh, media, etc., and of course, in the internet. So we have, a, uh, a, we have a few panelists that are going to present themselves, but I was just wanting to, uh, just to explain what was the, the, the particular format of this session. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, and um, I think that's a really interesting example of how to promote gender diversity and a, and a good example of... Um, Excuse me, it was, the important thing is that it was promoted as an... It was basically, it was, it was on social platforms and only on social platforms okay. that we launched this initiative. Great, and we look forward to hearing more about how, um, how that success came about. Um, and whether or not it could be applied um, in other contexts as well, I think will be really interesting to hear because the challenges differ so much from country to country. So um, I'll ask first for the panelists um, on one kind of side of the first panel that was merged with your panel, Jamais Sans Elle, to introduce themselves. It Maybe would be great to have a joint conversation. Uh, we we yeah. absolutely yeah. will. Um, we'll just have the introductions first. Uh, maybe I could start with you, Asad. I'm Sasha Cuesta Semyon. I'm representing Jamais Sans Elle here. Um, yeah, I'm Asad Beg. I'm from Pakistan and uh, the founder of Media Matters for Democracy, which is uh, uh, co hosting the session today. And very quickly uh, about Media Matters it's an organization in Pakistan which is working to defend the freedom of expression, um, communications, and more importantly, the media freedom. And uh, primarily we work on research and advocacy and uh, very recently we have found ourselves researching more and more into online spaces and how it's used or not used um, uh, in, in terms of a holistic democratic uh, participation in, um, uh, in, in various political conversations online. And uh, I'm hoping to talk more about that in the session today. Great, thank you. Is this, this is not working anymore, is it? No, I think it's working. Okay. Oh, that's great. Can they still hear online? Uh, okay, online. Hello, online. Yeah, online. Yeah, 
Okay. Oh, so it's, it's finally fixed. Okay, excellent. Thank you for fixing. <laughs> I don't know who we owe the thanks to, but thank you. Um, and so, Asa, thank you for your introduction. Um, Bishaka, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, my name is Bishaka Datta, and I work with a nonprofit in India called Point of View at the intersection of gender, sexuality, and technology. Thank you. Okay. Hi, I am Aki Das. Uh, I am Facebook's public policy director for South and Central Asia. I'm based out of New Delhi, and um, I hope to be a voice of the region in this particular uh, session. Thank you. Noah? And we have we have another panelist too. Hi, uh, my name is Noha Abdelbaki from Egypt. I'm an ISOC IGF ambassador, and I work at Dell Technologies in the data storage field. Great, thank you. So you I think. And yes, please. Please, yes. Okay, Sophie, can you introduce yourself in a few words? You. Your, yes, sure. your general management of the Ecole 42, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, sure. So I'm sorry, I don't speak really English, but I will try to be understandable. So I'm the managing director of 42, which is an unusual IT school. It has been created uh, five years ago by Xavier Niel. I don't know, maybe you know him. He's a French uh, telecom tycoon. He's the owner of one of the first telecom companies here in France. Okay, sorry. No, and uh, 42 is the first. No, that will be okay for now. Okay, just, okay. just a presentation. Okay, okay. Okay. But your English is, is your English okay. is excellent. Thank you, uh, Isabel. So uh, I am Isabel Galli. I'm working uh, in a French university called CNAM, founded in 1792. So it's a very old school. We have a lot of engineers, and we have not so much women in. Okay, and I'm Sylvain Attal. I will moderate. I'm, I'm co-moderating with you, and I'm a journalist, and I'm a, a co-founder of Jamais Sans Elle also. Thank you. Great, thank you. So I think what we'll do is we'll start with some perspectives from um, activists or civil society groups working um, in, in India and in Pakistan um, to uh, address issues of gender violence online and, and other issues related to gender disparity, um, to share some views on, on the challenges, and then, and then perhaps we can have, because we have a representative from Facebook here, Anki, you can respond to how pri some private sector actors are trying to address these very complex and difficult problems. So um, it, we can start with Asad on, on you, in, yes. And um, can I please be strict and give you three minutes only? I will warn you when we're coming to the end of that. I'll uh, try to finish in two and a half because we have uh, quite a lot of panelists and it's, I, I want to be an inclusive discussion. So very quickly, I'm a journalist primarily. Um, and like I said, one of the things that we have found ourselves is this research into online participation methods. We have very recently started this new uh, uh, journal or um, a website. It's called Trends Monitor. And what we do is we try and assess political hashtags in Pakistan and see the participation or kind of try and assess the nature of the participation. We have recently found out that uh, the political hashtags are kind of overflowed by, um, uh, by, by fake accounts. And uh, these fake accounts essentially are used to, in one way or another, create a certain political narrative, uh, be it from one political party or another, or even the forces who are working against the political discussion in Pakistan. And so this has led to a belief, and, and by the way, this whole, uh, this, this whole exercise is specially focused on targeting A, women journalists online, B, women politicians online, and C, anybody who uh, talks about generally in a very progressive manner about politics in Pakistan. So we've found out that this, uh, it, it's very easy to actually hijack a certain discussion online, on Twitter, Facebook, or to create a narrative online. And uh, you know, we've been also able to generate some evidence for it. Now, the question for us is, which is uh, an open question I'm going to leave uh, for this uh, discussion today. What do we do about it? One way of going about, which is, a popular, um, which is a popular sort of solution in Pakistan, India, and I'm sure most South Asian countries, is let the government take over this, let the government handle this. 
Now, we've seen in countries like Pakistan that, that when the government steps in, they come in with a very strong regulatory mechanisms. And often these mechanisms are used in any way possible against people who are politically uh, expressing themselves online and so on. So then government doing something about this clearly is out of question. Then what then we do about it? The only, uh, the only sort of reasonable way that we have, or it, uh, again, this is something that we need to open for the discussion here. The only reasonable way is that we, uh, we encourage the platforms to do something about it. But then who is going to make the, accounts, uh, make the platforms accountable? Who is going to ask questions when it comes to uh, big data, for instance, or privacy issues? Then there is a role of civil society organizations such as ours in Pakistan, which we see that need, they need to be strengthened and they need to perhaps work in tandem with, uh, with groups like Facebook and Twitter to make sure that the, there is a certain amount of um, uh, encouragement happening for these groups. So I'll just stop here. And like I said, it's um, you know, more than um, uh, instead of uh, having answers, I have questions for the panel. And I'll be happy uh, to sort of, you know, contribute to whatever discussion which happens. Thank you. Well, thank you, Asad. And from what I understood that you said there, the, the problem or the challenge, uh, to put it simply, is that online spaces um, can be easily hijacked or made non-inclusive or exclusive, depending on perhaps traditional power dynamics within society that are reflected then online. Um, and that means that this, this technology, which is meant to empower and um, bring, give people a voice, ends up not doing that. Um, and in particular, you're talking about political discussions in Pakistan and them being very difficult for women to get involved in because they're pushed, pushed out. Um, so maybe we could turn to you, Bishak. Is that a similar experience in, in India or, or is there a different dynamic there, Clay? Well, I wanted to actually talk about a group of young women in India who are between the ages of, say, you know, 16 to about 21 and who come from low-income families. And what we are finding actually is that the policy and the public discourse around access focuses very much on getting everybody online, but then it stops there. And what we are seeing is actually in these families, which are low-income families and their phones are shared, right? So these are all um, people who are using, who are mobile first. They're very rarely turning to laptops or tablets or uh, desktops, their whole interaction online is through mobile phones. The, what is happening more and more is that there is a real distinction between the kind of access that young women are being given to the internet and young men. So if there's a family where there's a brother and a sister, you know, the girl, and it's a shared family phone, the girl gets much less, the young woman gets much less time on the phone. She's constantly questioned, like every hour, like, well, who are you talking to? So it's sort of becoming like a way to monitor her activities and sort of surveil her in a family sense. Um, so I think what we really want to talk about is that it's not enough for us to think about access and political participation, you know, sort of till the person gets access. We really have to think about how different genders are using the internet and what freedoms they are being given. And I want us to think beyond online violence. I think so much of the discussion is just around online violence, but what about the day-to-day -day discrimination, the day-to-day -day freedoms that women have to use the internet? is um, something that we feel is really something that needs to come into the policy discussion. So really talking about restricted access, restricted use, what is meaningful access, you know, what is the freedom to um, use the internet in these kinds of settings. Great, thank you, Bishaka. I think that's really interesting um, because it is such a much more nuanced discussion of access than we normally hear, which about the multiple barriers or, or the, the multiple challenges that, um, that women can face um, due to traditional societal community um, roles that they play and how that's reflected online. And, and as you say, whatever the solutions are, we'll have to be sensitive to, to that. Um, so before we, we go to Jamais Sanzel for the you know, discussion of a different context altogether, um, a different approach. Um, I was wondering if you, Anki, have any, um, any reflections on what Facebook um, or 
perhaps more generally the private sector um, can do and should be doing as well as what they are doing to address this fact that there are multiple barriers um, and, and what does it mean to really provide meaningful access that's empowering for women and what role can the private sector do to ensure that? Yes, yeah, so I think building on what Bishakas just said, I, but the biggest barriers for women getting, there are different types of barriers. But if you look at uh, the mass segment, this is of course a mobile first generation, and at least in our region what we are seeing, uh, there is a, a primacy in terms of local language content to be available on the internet, but mostly the fight is about access to resources in our societies, right? Because there is huge amount of cornering of resources. If you buy a data plan, you will give it to the boy and not to the girl in the family. So there's those traditional access barriers are there. It is fueled by normative uh, concerns, considerations, which again, you know, a combination of both economic and social reasons. Uh, in order to uh, sort of alleviate some of these problems, what I think the private sector is doing, Facebook definitely is making a lot of effort in that area, is that we're investing a lot in terms of digital literacy and uh, safety training. Uh, making sure that people understand how to keep themselves safe online and what are the kind of uh, hygiene practices which uh, uh, you know young people must follow online and there's a concerted effort across the board uh, good linking of arms uh, by the internet sector in terms of making sure that local language content and digital literacy material is available that's one part the second point is essentially what Asad talked about which is a range of um, uh, you know, targeting of women who are active in public life or just have a big public voice, whether in media or politics, and <clears throat> making sure that they are not subjected to online hate speech. So there are a whole lot of activities which we as Facebook are taking in terms of implementing our community standards strictly, uh, making sure that we have a trusted flaggers network in our region where our partners from civil society are flagging these incidents to us and then we are enforcing against types of hate speech which target women. Also, there are various kinds of signals which we read in terms of understanding um, what are fake accounts and what are the activities which they are doing on the platform. And systematically, then there's enforcement to take down fake accounts from our platform, which is Facebook, because as you know, we are uh, vectored on authentic identity. So you have to represent yourself when you're on the platform. And that a combination of all of these tactics in terms of local community engagement as well as um, sort of being very particular in terms of enforcing our community standards has helped us in creating some kind of a protective gear to prevent women from getting uh, attacked online. Thank you. Um, and I'm sure there are also challenges with implementing some of those approaches. Maybe we'll hear a bit more about that later on. But before that, I would like to move to Jamais Sans Elle, some of the representatives from that, and we will come back to you. Jamais. Thank you, <laughs> of course. Um, as I told you, uh, Jamais Sans Elle was founded by uh, a community of men, I mean men, uh, all coming from the digital economy or entrepreneurs or journalists or whatever. Uh, and our primary field was France, of course, but then it evolved rapidly towards other actions beside, you know, just not participating to... It's, it's, it's very difficult to speak with noise because we don't have mics. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and... No, I'll leave it. Okay, so um, it, it evolved in a second series of uh, actions elsewhere in France, and first uh, intervention by Sacha Kester Semeon will explain you in a few words what, how Jamais Sans Elle evolved within these two years. Thank you, Sylvain. Thank you. Um, we are working on, on improving the presence and, um, and the commitment of women in every stage of the uh, and every level of the society because it's not a question here i think to say that there are not many women at high levels position and decision making and policy making around the world and um this is we are talking about half the population of the world so it's it's not normal but the what we are um, promoting at jamais sans elle it's a pledge 
that uh, mainly men are, are started to sing because um, we, this is a voluntary um, approach. Uh, we don't, we don't, do not seek uh, people to sign our, our pledge. That's the, the men them, themselves that, that uh, commit to the, this pledge. I will read it because it's very uh, short and straightforward. Um, there are too many panels, panels, discussions, round tables, experts, committees, or too many councils, meetings, and debating societies without women. From now on, we will no longer participate in any public media events at which topics relating to issues of common interest, society, politics, economic, science, and strategic matters, and debated, commented on, or assessed, and where there is no woman present among the many participants. That's the base of our, our commitment. But this is just the tip of the iceberg, because when there are not many women on panels, it's because what? Because event organizers or uh, generally the society doesn't seek for women at high position or at key position. And if they are, uh, they are not seeking for them, that there are not many at high position. And if there are not many at the high position, it's because there is a, um, a hiring decision or a hiring uh, uh, process that isn't um, that aren't uh, adapted to this kind of, uh, of uh, issues. And uh, in the tech realm, uh, which, uh, which our expertise too uh, as a professional in, uh, in this area, um, there are not uh, enough women. There are 30 percent women worldwide in the tech industry. That's not enough. At, at high position and, uh, and key roles, that's even less than that. And um, we are, uh, the, this is big, why uh, uh, Sophie and uh, Isabella are here too, to speak about the education uh, system and how we can um, improve the participation and the, um, of girls and women in STEM studies. And that, that's uh, actually the, the goal of Jamais Sans Elle, is to improve the um, participation globally of women. And uh, Thank also you, to, just to, to say that we have been selected as, um, as the French delegate for the Women 20, uh, which uh, is one of the seven commitment groups that must suggest an analyst and put forward recommendation for the 28 uh, uh, G20 Buenos Aires Summit. And we've um, worked with the International Co Committee to propose um, three recommendations on access for uh, women in rural areas, uh, financial uh, inclusion, digital inclusion, and participation in um, uh, technical development uh, regard um, regarding, uh, for example, um, gender biases in uh, artificial intelligence. That's a part of the work that we are doing um, uh, um, uh, on the side of the, the pledge. Thank you, Sasha, for explaining how a simple commitment turned into a real broader uh, engagement in favor of gender diversity. Sophie, maybe yes. can you explain how Ecole 42 is helping to uh, uh, promote uh, women's empowerment in tech industry specifically? Uh, well, thank you. Well, not, um, well, I will try, but not only for women, but also for diversity. Mm -hmm. So uh, 42 is the first completely free computer training courses. It's open to all uh, and accessible to 18 to 30 years old. It's um, a school where there is no degree requirement, there is no tuition fees, so this is completely free. And uh, the selection is made only to detect IT talents regardless any school background and any <coughs> social background. So the school is open 24 hours on seven days and it implements the principles of open education but go further by developing a system on self-education and the system is named peer-to-peer -peer learning um, so at first there is no lecture, there is no teacher, we do not uh, have any online lecture or something like that. So um, students are facing software development challenge and they need to create pieces of software. So to do this, they, the job they, they, they will be to, to gather and collect information, to test and verify, to discuss, uh, to uh, see if information is important or not, relevant or not, etc., etc. Um, and usually they can't do this alone, so they will need to collaborate. That's why uh, we call it peer learning. And um, students develop um, IT technical skills 
but also adaptation, problem solving, collaboration, critical thinking, self-learning, creativity, diversity handling, and agile state of mind to state the unknown. <coughs> so we have for now 4,200 students in Paris and 800 students in uh, the Silicon Valley. So in US, where you know studies are very expensive and blocking the way for many individuals to receive an education and find a well-paid job, which is easy in IT because uh, you know there is a lack of, uh, of talent. And um, for conclusion, we have uh, two more times internships offer and job offer than our number of students. We have outstanding evaluation from companies and often career start before 42 certificates. So this is a real success. But, and there is a but, uh, we have only 15% of girls. And I think this is the same um, in all, the, um, all the, the computer engineering schools, as uh, Isabel could say also. Okay, and, and th something important, 42 is free? Yes, completely free. Okay. You mentioned it? Did yes, you mention it? Oh, okay. Excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, excuse me. Isabel, you're, a, you're a directing a chair on the future of work at the CNAM. I'm not sure that everybody here knows what's the CNAM. The CNAM is an in engineer school. Not only. Not only. Uh, not only. It's, a uh, it's the largest French university and one, one of the oldest, uh, not compared to the uh, Sorbonne, but uh, and we have a lot of tech students, 30 percent of students are, tech, are, are for tech. So, but my point is not to talk about my school, my point is to talk about my experience. Um, I joined the internet in 1996. In that time, we were not so few women because there is not so much women. We were only a few people doing this conversa online conversation. I had a great hope uh, uh, at that time. I thought that because we were all starting a new technology, we would be equal. But in fact, it did not happen. It did not happen, and I don't know why. I don't know why men take the lead on the internet, and we were step back. We were uh, not as visible. We, do, we had less voice and whatever. People now explained to me it's because women do not, do not choose to go to tech school. So they are not building the internet. They are not building, but building is not the voice. So I still no, do not understand why women are not so <coughs> on the internet. It's maybe because women have a perception of the world uh, a bit different from, from men. I don't say it's from your both, but I say um, you could have a different perception because your place in the world is uh, given by your birth is not the same. So now internet is a man world. And as you know, the men world are never safe for women. There's another mov movement called Me Too. And this movement, movement show us that every woman in life face a dangerous situation. So when you decide to go online in a man world, you decide to face situation. You, have, you decide to face harassment online. So if you want to, to, to develop the, the, the number of women going on online, you have to protect them online. You have to, to make policy who protect from harassment, for, who protect from insult and things like that. So the first thing for me, if you want women, you need a safe world because if the world is not safe, women will never join the conversation. The second point, Always with, everybody always told me, you are not competitive enough. Men are more competitive than you. They want to success more than you. Okay, that's right. M m you, if you see in France, there is a, the World Cup, the World Cup for football. The World Cup is even every four years, you join the World Cup, you go to bar, you support your team, your national team, it's all about men, only men. So the, our national heroes this year are all men, that's all. So we value a lot this kind of competition in our country. Even if we support women to success, we value more uh, conquest sport than artistic sport, for example. And the third thing, it's very difficult for, for women to, f to find allies. It's really difficult because in this world, there is not so much women, so you can make a team with other women. You have to make a team with men. And that's the point with Jamais Sans Elle. Some 
men take the risk to support women. There is no obligation to support women. They, they, they do not need that for success. But they say this world will not be the same without any woman. And that's why they decide to, to take the risk to say, I will not attend a, con a conference if there is no woman at the table. And sometimes it causes trouble. I remember some meetings that just called me two hours before, could you join the, the, the conference? Because there is no woman. If, if there is no woman, the conference will not happen. It's why, it's why I'm invited at the moment. It's because I'm the only woman who could speak about something that is only men who could speak about in the mind of the others. That was my point. Thank you. I should have mentioned that there's a, something a little bit difficult to understand is why girls are doing particularly well in high school, in math, in science, so they're competitive. And there, there's a problem that because there are too few of them are accessing science and math or engineering school in after, after high school. Why, why uh, uh, yeah. maybe it's because of the education, it's because maybe, well, what, I, what I, s I, s I know about uh, mm. the girl who joined our uh, engineering school, the, First, to, before to join, they are afraid to join a men world. There is 80, 85 percent, even 90 percent of the students were men. They knew they would be harassed in school. They know it. Every engineer school has to face that. And because it's dangerous, it means sexual, harassment. sexual harassment. insult, whatever. Whatever. Misogyny. You are not. You are, you are, pardon? Misogyny. Misogyny. Okay. Yeah, misogyny, sorry. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So you, you must be very courageous to do that. So, so courageous, because you know the, the men will not accept you. It's not they do not, but you know that it's, 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 they act like tribe. So in video games, it's obvious. You do on video games platform, it's men driven. It's horrible the way they see women. And, if for, if for a young girl if who would like to play video games, she could not imagine she could join a school where you learn to code because the environment is like in a video game. Yeah, we may, um, sure, we, we still have another panelist um, to provide her perspectives. Oh, and I just wanted to ask you, because you've heard now um, uh, different perspectives on the challenges to inclusive access and what it means to be able to um, use the internet as a woman or to be able to participate in these discussions in a way that is um, that is really inclusive and and that's you know very challenging for a number of different reasons including misogyny including um, uh, you know, unequal power relations more generally um, so that women don't feel safe online but you also heard some responses for how that can be challenged through campaigns like Jamais Sans Elle and the work that you're doing even at the G20 and also through education, um, including supporting further education in science and technology. Are these solutions or ways that you think would work, things that would work in Egypt? Or, and what are the particular challenges? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So first, think? I have a comment for my colleagues for, uh, from Jamais Sans Elle. Actually, the African IGF, which, which was held last week uh, in Khartoum, had many several panels, which are all men panels. So, yeah, if you can cooperate with them to, to decrease that. Um, uh, okay, so I'm echoing uh, the previous panelists, and thank you for uh, your interventions. Um, when it comes to women in technology, we have some sort of filtration. Um, in many cultures, uh, women are being told that uh, STEM education is not for you. It's, for, it's a man thing. Like, uh, if they, they, they grow up with this perception. Even if they have a bug in their phone, they will give it to the man uh, in ho at their home. Uh, so that's the first uh, filtration pro uh, phase. And then uh, even uh, when they are um, engineers or technologists, um, they may give up their career and just prioritize their family life. So we end up with a lack of expertise from women and with very few talented women in the market. And that's not like um, a regional perspective. I think it, it happens in many countries, not only in, in Egypt. Uh, but um, I'm seeing many uh, initiatives to, to bring more women in tech, uh, to bring like more women in cybersecurity or AI or different um, 
uh, emerging technologies. Um, I'm bringing one example on why we need women uh, in engineering and in design. Um, actually, I heard that example in the last IGF. Uh, there was a woman who happened to be a doctor, and she was um, a member in a gym, and uh, there was uh, specific hours for women. So when she swiped her card to enter the gym, the access was denied because the title was a doctor, and the system translated a doctor as being a man, not a woman. <laughs> so... That's an example. We need to have ethics when it comes to design and engineering. Um, I'm talking from my own experience because um, I'm an engineer and I work for several corporates for now. Um, women are given um, um, office-based jobs mainly, not uh, field jobs or implementation and deploy jobs or even design jobs. And we don't see many women in the top management of ICTs. And that's, a, that's an issue because we don't see women in decision-making um, uh, dialogues and, and when it comes to private sector. Um, um, I will, I will t uh, talk about uh, some initiatives at Dell. Um, we have a community uh, at Dell co called Women in Action. It's for the employees. It provides uh, women-to-women mentorship and activities for women at the corporate. It's, it's not based in Egypt. It's a global community within Dell, so you will see uh, the same community in um, other offices for Dell. And we have um, um, a team called the University Relations Team, uh, which works with um, university students and professors. We offer technical um, courses for uh, students and we even organized um, some graduation project uh, competitions and last year the winning team was an all-women team so that's a great thing and um, it, it, it need like a, it's a continuous process of improvement if we have um, more women in tech we'll get a safer internet we will get a more inclusive internet thank you Great. Thank you for, for sharing your perspectives and also some concrete examples of how things can change. Um, so I wanted to ask if any of the panelists want to respond to any of the points that were made by other panelists. Otherwise, we can, we can open up to the, um, to the rest of the, well, to the audience, to everyone else who's here. Shaka. I just wanted to make a small point, which is that I largely agree with everything that's been said. But I think one of the other issues that we're finding with women's participation in online spaces is that many women, because they've been told that technology is not for you or technology is for you in a very limited sense, actually don't feel a sense of belonging in this space. So I would actually say that along with safety, which is very important, that first women have to feel like they belong in this space, right? And again, I'm not necessarily talking about women who are in this room who might feel a sense of belonging, but really many women who come from lower income families, etc., right? Um, who anyway are not being given this technology. So we are finding in our workshops in India that before we go to some of the issues like safety, violence, harassment, all of which are very, very important, that first we have to sort of somehow explain that you are not a bystander in this place. You also belong here. This space is also for you, and we are seeing this also on a lot of WhatsApp groups, because WhatsApp is the most popular social media platform in India. Um, is like, for instance, if there are groups of journalists not in English, but say in other local languages, and say there's a WhatsApp group with many more male journalists and a few female journalists, often the women will just not say anything in that group. So they're always just listening or, you know, like bystanders or witnesses, but they're not like active participants in that space. So I feel we need to think about that also as part of the whole sort of big gender picture. 
Absolutely. And uh, I wonder if there's anyone in the audience who has um, experience of that as well, or ideas, or is part of um, trying to bring solutions to ensuring that women in particularly low income um, settings feel like the internet's for them and it's it's not just interesting or, or whatever, it's actually really going to help them with what they would like to achieve in their lives and, and be a tool for them. Yes. Um, uh, an excellent discussion, so I congratulate you all on that. A point on why girls do not uh, join STEM education is also because of textbooks, because of the way that the textbooks have been written, especially mathematics and science textbooks. Uh, they are written uh, in a way that uh, they are more biased towards the male lens. And uh, women are often verbal learners, and men are spatial learners. And these books are written in a more spatial way, whereas uh, it, when it should, be, should have been written to cater to uh, you know, a gender equal audience, these books were created a long time back. And uh, we need to reform the education system in terms of textbooks <coughs> as well. Um, uh, another point uh, that ma'am uh, was talking about is very relevant in India. I work with young girls in India. And I wanted to ask, I had a question that how do you um, ensure that uh, you know, these women don't feel, uh, these young girls don't feel that they are bystanders? Because I often feel that uh, <coughs> because women are not respected in political discussions, like you see the drawing room discussions that we have in India, a woman often is not allowed to or not, or their perspective is not entertained and often ridiculed even. Um, so how do you step, uh, personally I've experienced this uh, within my family as well, which is a very educated family, where when I spoke about my feminist views, I was told <coughs> that um, this might create problems in your future. And I presume it was about getting married to a man. <laughs> Obviously, I'd like to get married to someone who's uh, not sexist. But um, so, how do you how do you um, ensure that uh, at a very young age we are able to step in and sort of you know inject that uh, drive of gender equality? And maybe that's a question for you, Vishaka. But also, I was wondering if you think that movements or campaigns or initiatives like Jamais Sans Elle or those kind of voluntary bottom-up approaches could provide um, not a solution but be part of the solution in absolutely. context like India. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think what you've asked is a really relevant question and I think it goes, the answer goes beyond technology, right? So we have to start at a young age by ensuring that girls feel public spaces are for them and that they can participate in public discussions, in political action, you know, discussions, etc. Because otherwise what happens is all, you know, say till the age of 14, this girl has been told, no, you can't, this public space is not for you, you have to stay in the home, etc. It's very difficult then when your formative lessons are like this to suddenly change it when the mobile phone comes, right? But at the same time, I will say that just like the experiences you all shared, we are also seeing in India that you can start the empowerment process with technology or with the mobile phone, right? And that itself can trigger off sort of empowerment offline as well. So it works both ways, yeah. And, and do you think a jamais sans elle movement would work in India? Do you think men would take up the mantle of saying we won't go to any panels without women or similar initiatives? Do you think that would take off or is the time not quite right yet? I think it would take okay. off. Why not? Because I think increasingly, like in India also, we have a, you know, on Twitter there's been a lot of conversation about particularly technology conferences where it's assumed that only men have the expertise to talk and there's actually a list online talking about um, you know women and other genders who can participate in these panels etc so I think this is very much a consideration in India and I also want to say that in the same way that you know Me Too is a fo force at the global level over the last couple of months, we've had a very, very big Me Too India movement where women are questioning sexism, misogyny, sexual harassment, etc. So I think, you know, also in a, in a connected world, you learn from each other. You see things that work in other countries and you say, hey, maybe I, we can do this in our country as well. Yeah. 
So, there is another yes. movement, uh, mm -hmm. it's not movement, but it's another habit that women have now in uh, offices, is when uh, you are interrupted by a man, another woman takes the voice and interrupts the man and, like the, and give back the, 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 to, to, the, to, your, the, to the woman who was who speaking first. That's, that's a good way, and it's that in the, in the white hall. So it's what you said, uh, you have experience in, in the world that you can uh, have in your own countries, and you, are, you could import. Yeah, great. And I think there are a number of different examples, and it's great to have these conversations because you're, you either learn of them or you're reminded of them. And um, yes, I will come to you. Sir. Yeah, I, I would like to add something okay. about the, the panel, mm -hmm. um, which is called how can ICT um, uh, makes the world more human. This is about humanism. We are talking about how to live together, how to work together, how to uh, have a better participation of women and, and, and minorities, <coughs> visible or not. That's not the question, that for a better living together. And um, I think we need um, a change of mindset, a global change of mindset uh, about uh, uh, many topics but um, <laughs> around the world because we have a lot of problems but <laughs> gender diversity and gender equality is one uh, that we can act together not only men taking participation of it but working uh, with women we have a, a women's council in, a, in our organization also uh, uh, entrepreneurs um, uh, executive uh, uh, from uh, companies we are working with uh, directly with enterprises that um, and companies that, uh, to implement uh, internal and external uh, charter of conduct and guidelines to uh, have better uh, hiring processes, uh, better uh, career um, uh, promotions, etc. And um, yeah, we're yeah. looking now with uh, for a month. Or maybe or you so. can say a word of your partnership with Microsoft. It would be interesting, maybe. No? A yeah, few we're words. working with Microsoft Front on this. Uh, we've written with, with them a charter for um, uh, that uh, they say that they, it's, it's basically the same. They will not organize or take um, um, participation in any panels or event without women. That is uh, internal uh, meetings or external or even there, uh, there, there is a female presence at their um, client meetings. Uh, that's, I think the, the, that's the one of the uh, um, action that we can take with the enterprises. We have also um, about uh, 30 ambassadors and French consuls around the world that took the pledge, men and women, no? that, that's a, a mix. And as long as um, uh, 50 uh, member of parliament and senators. But I would like to add something that we need to mentor young boys too. Yeah. That's, that's uh, we need to mentor everybody on this on this topic because we have to, as boys, we have to uh, learn how to live together. That's what I said before, and we are not diff you are not special on any manner. We are different, but we are part of the same world. We are building the same thing. We are living together, and that's the the thing. That's that's um, uh, our um, our mindset is humanist, humanistic, actually. So it's to improve the, the, the life and the, and the world, actually. I think maybe, maybe Sophie can, can yes. say a and word. We have a question. Yes. Yes. Okay. Ah, okay. 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 Yeah, go on. family and going through many experiences in this field I have learned that we cannot wait for all these you know biased ideologies to end so that girls and women can take a step further no we cannot do this and we cannot wait for our
for young boys or for uh, you know brothers, uh, fathers or whatever to take a step a step further. I think we need to give more visibility to women. We were to talking about this yesterday, like for the Nobel Prize winner, she got a Wikipedia page just after, right after she got the Nobel Prize winner. Although <coughs> she was doing a very great job, but she wasn't visible on the, on the online space, and we couldn't hear from her. We couldn't see her fights, and we couldn't get inspired. There are many super girls all over the world, many Malalas, many fighters, but they are not visible. And I think we need to give them a chance to speak up. And we need to, to, to show that you can come from a low uh, income family, you can come from the global south, you can come from wherever you, you come, and you can do a great job. Because it's up to you. Okay, that's, that's what I meant. Thank you. Thank you. We, Thank we, you. We, I think we, we're here today to, in, to uh, envisage solutions. So mm -hmm. how, how do we do that, for example? If someone has ideas in, t in terms of improvement mm -hmm. from the so civil society or from government, from NGO, etc., how do we do it in practice? How do we do to, to have this improvement and make that, for example, this Nobel Prize, for example, the, 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 the further Nobel Prize, if she's a woman, she would have a, a Wikipedia notice before having a, 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 a Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. Yes, thanks. No. So I believe that female experts need to be content creators, okay? Fem uh, women are not really good with, with marketing their, themselves or, or their success, but... Uh, it I cannot believe that. <laughs> really? <laughs> no, they, they, they don't cr take credit for their work, so... Sure. Women need to take credit for their work and market for it and, and create content about it. So if she's she the, the, the Nobel Prize winner needed to market for herself or for her work before even winning, and that that uh, when will uh, women uh, feel belong to this online space and will feel s safe when they come online? Thank you. Uh, so we've got two, two questions, I think three. Um, We'll take them one by one, but I think the question that you asked about what are some solutions and what are the roles of different stakeholders in a, addressing these issues, like we've heard quite a few initiatives that um, some private actors have taken, like Microsoft, to hi changing hiring processes or signing up to charters. Etc. So those are some examples, and if you can think of or share any others, that would be really interesting to hear as well. So we'll take your question, your question, and then um, your question. So Can you hear? Yeah. Um, it's not, my name is Nicole Peter Patterson, and I am from the Caribbean. She leads it and also related with an NGO, Women's Economic Imperative. In response to what can be done, exactly as the colleague from um, India Youth Group was speaking about, and we were speaking about it yesterday, one of, some of what we've been doing in the Caribbean region, very small compared to a lot of the, the other um, regions here, is engaging girls in hackathons so this is as and that gets them in that space the girls that we're speaking about are girls in the senior level of high school and in university so those who would be moving to go into that pipeline to go into the industry of course we need to be doing it much earlier in terms of their engagement in stem as well but what that has done is that has built a and this is only we've only been doing it for two years so far and that has built and um, a wave of them as content creators. And even out of that, we have um, one school in Trinidad and Tobago specifically that has developed two initiatives, mobile apps actually. Um, one is in response to gender-based violence and the other one is in response to, you know, um, one is GBV and the other one is in terms of cyberbullying. Cyber both of them have attracted the attention of the Inter-American Development Bank and Microsoft in the region. So I think the key thing is the STEM engagement, but not more than STEM just in the textbooks, but engaging the girls in addition to the fact that the boys are already there in 
hands-on type initiatives. I think that's where we're seeing that there is a significant difference. And um, we're doing it with the, with the ITU, International Telecoms Union Equals Program as well. So hopefully through that, what we're hoping is that that will push out across the LAC region and otherwise with UN Women. Thank you very much for sharing those experiences. And we have also comment or question from there. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you all panelists for your insights. Uh, my name is Lois and I come from Uganda. I'll briefly talk about like, uh, online participation, like some of the panelists have already mentioned. So when we talk about women's online participation, I think we should not only look at like women from low income country, uh, uh, families or even countries, it cuts across. I'll talk briefly about our work in Uganda we, on uh, Women at Web, where we're trying to find out how women participate in online spaces. And we interacted with the women who are active online journalists, and the experience was really not good. One journalist said, she's a vocal one, she said, for me, I don't Google myself, because she knows that there is a lot of negative uh, talk, and that limits our participation. Then another vocal one said, for me, when I go online, it's war, because she knows the backlash. So those are the dynamics in online spaces. And one of the issues that came out, and they were wondering, how do we build that online social support so that women are not pushed offline, are not pushed to offline spaces, not only the those who, do, who can't afford, there are those who can, who can afford and they have the platform and they have the capability, but the dynamics there are forced, have forced them to go offline, especially women politicians, journalists, so any, any vocal woman who would want to engage substantively online, they are forced to go offline because of the negativity, the toxic nature of online engagements. So how do we garner that support through uh, uh, different uh, methodologies and, uh, and coalitions to make sure that women who have at least owned the space, who have tried to belong to the space, as you have mentioned, are not uh, gagged, are not uh, being forced to go away, even the little uh, knowledge or the little space they have gained cannot be taken away from them. Yeah, that was my uh, either comment or a suggestion. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Shiza Erin from Uganda. I'm part of the Media Legal Defense Initiative on this conference. Um, I want to contribute to the solutions that were asked I think one of the ways that uh, this problem can be overcome of women participation is we need like in private initiative organizations that are actually in the defense of women interests online. For example, what about a platform that creates digital pages, the, I mean something like a Wikipedia, but f mainly for women who are extraordinary across regions and across countries because it's not good to depend on the goodwill of people who may not be women or who may not be interested in women affairs to create those pages. So if those pages are created, those platforms are created, then people will learn about their existence sooner and more women will be inspired. What about having a prat an organization that, the, for example, the achievements of women which are recorded on, on Facebook are sponsored Facebook the, I heard of a Facebook person here. They have this sponsorship form. Can we have some organization that actually sponsors them? And that also being done across Twitter, across all social media. How can we optimize women voices? And also my, uh, my, my friend from Uganda was talking about women being gagged. That's very true. We need to understand the nature of attacks against women. You have seen nude pictures of some women, like singers in our area, leaking. That's for some women that will hold back from their participation. Can we have uh, dedicated organization mounting suits against people who do 
do, do, do those leakages? Can we have people whose law is basically to respond on behalf of some, some women would may be meek, others are very vocal. But for those who cannot, who are either meek and are not willing to defend themselves, can we have people who can gather facts and m m come to the defense, both online and non-online defense of women who are under attack? Because the fact is that as long as these attacks against women participation, the few women who are participating in these online platforms are not being answered, then it has a chilling and a snowball effect against the, it disincentivizes the participation of other women. Yes, absolutely. And um, would you like to react to yeah. some of the points that yeah, were made? Yeah, about I just want to tell to everyone, I have the feeling we have tried all the solutions to, to improve the visibility, to improve the access to women to, to uh, tech studies and whatever. But only the law could help really women to go online because we, we, we have to clarify in law what is online intimidation. We have to, to, to protect them when they show herself. Um, first, uh, the French first lady is facing a lot of hate when she's going out and uh, when she's speaking online and and this is, and she is a first lady could you imagine younger girl uh, uh, political uh, political less protect it's impossible to be visible if you are uh, under uh, an attack online the problem is how, how do you react because you have the problem of anonymity, you have proxies, you, find you have... You are helped by Microsoft, by, uh, by Twitter, by Facebook, you make alliance for that and uh, you do uh, a cause. Uh, for, for, for the question of anonymity, I think the law should be authorized. Rosa, of people who are offending women's rights, there should be a, a, a neutral third party that authorizes, it could be a court that if there is an anonymous attack on a woman, then that, that the anonymity should be broken into. Of course, like every right, there must be limitations as long as they are necessary and proportionate, and I think that would be a very necessary ground for limiting anonymity. Yeah. I don't know if yes, um, yeah, okay. we, we, I think the, the, co the conversation has interestingly turned from what can private actors do and what role does education have to play to what are some of the um, legal and regulatory frameworks that are conducive to supporting yes. uh, women online um, and so if anyone has any um, reflections on that that yeah, would be Sophie, good. Sophie had yeah. something to say because then we'll on, uh, on a yeah. previous school she managed to have a, a woman driven let's say uh, um, okay. alumni 80% women? No, it yeah, was that? not only me. No. no. Well, I will try it in okay, English. Okay, Sorry. Try, okay. just, just one thing I wanted to be positive because uh, things are changing a little. Well, I think I'm leading one of the biggest uh, computer science school in France, which is really, really not usual. So I'm very proud to be one of the first. And if you put a girl leading school, in fact, that changed things because the first thing I did in my school that was to be concerned about how girls um, will be welcome in the schools. Mm. And so um, um, the school before, I uh, you know, just Isabel was true because one thing very important is girls doesn't want to go in a school or in a place where there is only men. You know, they are really afraid about that. So you have to to change these things. And it is very simple just to say to girls, so we save a place for you. And you mean quotas, for example? Yes, quotas. Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> Some people are not uh, agree are not with that, but uh, I think it's a good thing. Um, in 42. Just like we did in politics in France, for example, we had to do. Yeah, but um, well, in, in the school in 42, we have um, uh, how you said. Uh, well, we have an, uh, you apply to the school, and then after you have online test, and th then after you can come to a um, conference collective. Yeah. Collective conference. Collective conference. I think something like that, and then after you can have the uh, yeah, the piscine. I don't know if you heard about that. It's a <laughs> it's a in immersion uh, period of four four weeks, and after that you can go in the school. So it's very very hard, but I just uh, asked to my to my um, to my staff to save, and I had and I had a very um, how to say the uh, communication on that, and said for now we are going to save 50% of the place of the 
collective conference for women. And just to say that, just to do that, so girls think, oh, okay, you're thinking about me, you are saving a place, so, and, and I won't be just a little minority. Because, you know, when you came in a place and you're the only girl, <laughs> if you said, okay, did I eat something wrong? I, I, I'm in the good place, okay? So just th this little thing. And before I, um, I start a, a session with 80 persons, of women, and just because they knew that there will be the majority, they came because they knew they can help each other and everything like that. So just sometimes do a little things just to save place and say, you're welcome. And also, because I lead the school, I say to all my staff, if I see only one time something like misogyny or something like that, <laughs> it's going to be a real problem for you. <laughs> and just that right. is okay. Thank, <laughs> Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you so for much. sharing that. And I think um, what, what that says is how important it is to have leaders and to have people in positions who can make decisions like that actually commit um, and basically put their foot down and say, um, you know, this, this is how it's going to be and it's go we're going to promote this policy and taking those actions is really important for, for making change. But Bishaka, you wanted to make a point. Very quickly, just three points. One is, I think I really feel like Me Too has shown us how to build a supportive community online, right, with each woman supporting another woman who's speaking out and tweeting on Facebook, on social media. But I want to say that this responsibility to create a welcoming space and a safe space where all genders can feel comfortable, the responsibility cannot only be on us as users. I really feel the platform has to take some responsibility. And I'm a part of the Wikipedia community. And when we realized at Wikipedia that there was a very big gender gap, and I was on the board at that time, we took a lot of steps which may not have all been perfect, but we acknowledged the problem. And we said, yes, we have to do something about it. So I don't think that Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, WhatsApp, or any platform, big or small, can say, oh, we are just a platform. You know, and they all are the users, you all figure it out. I don't think that's acceptable at all. I think platforms have to take responsibility for this. And um, the other thing that I actually, I think that's pretty much it. Yeah. Oh, anonymity. Sorry, that's what I wanted to say. You know, I, again, we work with a lot of people who are bisexual, gay, lesbian, trans, queer. And anonymity is really important because for many of the people we work with, they are not out to their families in offline spaces. And it's only because of online spaces that give them anonymity that they can build little communities. So I want to say that anonymity is a tool. It can be used for good and it can be used for bad. And I'm not comfortable with asking that we take away anonymity online. Yeah, thanks for that point, Bishak. And I think that's a really interesting point about anonymity is that it's actually how it's used as a tool is reflective of the broader structures in place and it, addressing those broader power um, inequalities is about much more than just um, attacking one tool or one instance of, of um, the tool being used in a specific way. So it's a much more complex issue and I think being aware of that is going to be important so that we don't actually end up harming the people we're really trying to support in the mean, in the, in the, um, in a, the attempts to address the issue. So we have two other questions, so I'll go with you first. Okay. Um, yeah, my name is Menno Etzma. I work for the Council of Europe in the Anti-Discrimination Department, and we are also behind the No Hate Speech Movement Youth Campaign, which is a, to empower young people to speak up against hate speech. Our experience is, We've, we've campaigned on sexist hate speech too, and we, our experience here is that hate speech, there's always a discussion around hate speech about freedom of expression or hate speech and et cetera and this whole gray area. I think what's interesting is how that debate about should things stay up or not really gets contaminated when it comes to, when it comes to women or targeting women because then sexism and uh, sexual harassment and all these kind of things come in and then it becomes a much more a multi, uh, multi-facet discussion. And I think we do need to go back to this really splitting these two things. I mean, the discussion about is something freedom of expression or hate speech, that's one. But as soon as sexism comes in, it becomes something else. And I think the Council of Europe's work through the Istanbul Convention on Sexual Violence and uh, Domestic Violence uh, also has some indications there on what could be done on addressing sexual harassment online, on sexism. And I think this should really be 
picked up through legislative uh, measures. And I think there are areas where you can say, okay, this is freedom of expression, but as soon as it becomes sexism, it becomes something else. And I think we should also go back to the internet companies and to look into their assessment protocols, because we are in an ongoing discussion about what's hate speech and what's not. But I think it can be even sharper when it comes to hate speech targeting women, because that is, that is a more complex situation. Uh, and I think many women in politics, for example, do not suffer hate speech as such as more sexist hate speech, and that's a very different type of animal. And I think we need to be here, when it comes to gender equality, let's also have gender equality in hate speech then, and that's, if I may so be so crude. Yes, exactly, and it's really important to get those, those questions right. Um, so, we'll go, you, yes, and then we have questions. Sorry. We do have to wrap up in 10 minutes, so I'm going to be aware of that. Yes, of course. All right, I'm going to try to be as concise as possible, and I'm happy I could follow up from this, uh, this comment about uh, platforms taking responsibility. I, uh, my name is Emil, I work for the Danish Institute for Human Rights, and we do a lot of human rights impact assessments uh, in relation to, to companies in general, often more related to supply chains. Um, but I think just a week ago, Facebook came out with a report on how it um, were complicit in hate speech in uh, Myanmar uh, in relation to the Rohingya situation there. And I think, or actually it's more of a question to, to some of you here, maybe before we were talking about Pakistan, about the platforms, you were talking about platform responsibility, and is that a way, obviously not a silver bullet, obviously doesn't solve participation itself, but it, what regards hate speech or sexist speech or misogyny on these platforms, to actually have companies take their responsibility and do impact assessments. What is the impact on their platform? How does that affect women? We've been talking about in Uganda, anyone who comes online, we're talking about in France uh, with, the, with the first lady even. Um, and do you think that is not a solution to solve it all, but that actually it should be instituted, that companies should actually in fact do human rights impact assessments and see what is the, um, you know, the, the, the consequences of my platform. Uh, and I would like particularly direct to, to Pakistan and, and India maybe then, um, if you have any responses to this. Great, so yes, we can, we can go straight to Asad. And then, uh, with, is that a, with actually, um, you know, we are talking about gender um, parity here, so maybe we should go to you first. Mine is I'm a sorry, brief Asad. intervention, thank you, about uh, just to complete from my colleague from the Council of Europe. I'm also from the Council of Europe and I, I'm the head of gender equality there and we are currently um, preparing a recommendation to our member states uh, on sexism and combating sexism and it includes, the draft includes a section on the internet and of course we want to be able to um, provide this text, it's, a, it's going to be unique text um, that addresses um, combating sexism and uh, so we have a section on the internet and we want to be able to uh, find the right balance, of course, where the responsibility should be with uh, the governments in legislating in order to protect um, uh, spaces online for, for users um, uh, without, of course, stifling the free speech, which is the great potential also that the Internet represents. Um, and so, um, and I particularly also to find that balance so that responsibilities of, of um, of uh, private enterprise are duly um, taken into account so that they can operate but within certain lines that will um, respect dignity uh, for and encourage participation of, of girls and women. Uh, before we wrap Thank up, I, I'd like to, to bring the question of artificial intelligence. Yes. Excuse me, because it's really, it's really important, because we only have 10 minutes, just a few minutes with Sasha, because I think we, we've been talking about the present war, mm -hmm. but the next war, is it artificial intelligence? Are we already seeing the gap, the gender gap in that field too? So Sasha wants to say well about yeah, that. Yeah, we, we talked a little bit about the, the use of the technologies and the internet. And we have to put some ethics in how they are tools, how the uh, networks, how the platform are built, and what is the intention because everything is built by big companies and business driven like uh, Facebook or Amazon, etc. When Amazon use uh, AI algorithms in their um, hiring process where uh, their uh, data uh, sets are based, mm -hmm. 
they are not uh, seeing many women in the, um, in the um, pr jobs uh, offers because uh, the, the data sets were biased. And we have to be uh, vigilant on this. And how, wh how, we, we do we f how do we feed the machine? Mm -hmm. what what is the, the intention? Yeah, the machines uh, and, and pro. Uh, yeah, not only AI, but uh, on every process on building um, uh, infrastructure and platforms. That's it's relevant for the what, why we are here. It's a, a question Absolutely. of governance. Do you mean we are building? We're building a male artificial intelligence right now. Yeah. A male, uh, a male-driven technologies. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah, I, I think that the uh, so, thank you for for that intervention, and I think the um, example you gave now of, of um, a system not recognizing a doctor as a woman yeah. is one of many many examples, yeah. um, and and there needs to be a response um, that is is inclusive of women, which would you know allow for a sustainable long term mm -hmm. um, solution to this, this uh, issue. And ju just want to to add something that we are launching today a pledge. Um, aimed at the internet governance uh, organizations and um, uh, think tank, etc. We are singing today with uh, uh, Isaac France, uh, Reporters Without Borders, and uh, a think tank which is Renaissance Numérique. Uh, this is just the start at uh, internet governance organizations and NGOs to say that we, they will not be uh, organizing uh, conferences or council on important uh, um, governance uh, projects or uh, issues without any woman. We are launching it today. Great, and I, I'm, I'm sure there will be a lot of support for that and from everyone in this room. Um, but before we wrap up, and I, I can do a brief summary of the discussion so far, um, I'd like to go to Asset, and there was a question directed at you as well about whether or not you think that uh, intermediaries or platforms um, should adopt, for example, a human uh, rights impact assessment. I'll just take one minute. I think the question for me to take away from this discussion today is are we building not just a male AI system, but also um, a, a primarily a system which, is, which does not see race or does not see ethnicity or does not see gender or did not, does not see any of the underlying uh, nuances which are, which are very common in society, local societies, communities, so on. One of the things I wanted to, uh, just to quickly respond to your question, sir, one thing that we've recently seen in Pakistan is Twitter actively, and Facebook, of course, but I'll uh, uh, focus on Twitter here more, Twitter actively taking off some accounts um, in, in, a, in a political debate in Pakistan. It was a very heated, sort of religious, undertoned debate, which was calling um, for a lot of hate. But one thing that in, in discussions like this we usually tend to miss, generally, is not the hate speech, but the incitement to violence, specifically. And in, in uh, online spaces, incitement to digital violence. There are many studies in Pakistan, I'm sure um, there are others as well, that we've seen that digital violence has a very, very high likelihood of getting converted into physical violence, especially if it's directed at women. And this is with what we've seen multiple times. About the impact assessment, this is a very interesting question for me as well, because there was this religious campaign uh, going on in Pakistan, which was actively inciting violence against some people. We saw that Twitter take off, took off the account of the lead person who was doing it. But then there were thousands of other fake accounts running and doing the same thing. And essentially, the trend which was trending, uh, the conversation which was happening, the violence which was being incited, remained there. So now the action is something that we need to uh, take care of. Was that action enough? Do we need to uh, sort of take a, a more stronger, sterner action? And if we do that, then what are the, uh, what are the boundaries that we need to uh, take care of? Are we then uh, saying in our conversations that the right to be anonymous should not exist? So this is the kind of balance that perhaps for me, uh, as, as a student, I, I'll sort of, you know, I'll, I'll uh, uh, try to learn more from this conversation. Um, we, are, we do have to end now. Um, we have two minutes left. Um, so I think that this conversation can definitely continue um, after, after the session, of course. And uh, although we've heard so many of the challenges um, that are being faced, I think one thing that has come up for me is how similar some of these challenges are across 
different countries from Pakistan, India, Caribbean, um, even France, we're hearing uh, similar challenges, but also really interesting initiatives and ideas that could cross boundaries. Um, and I think what's also been interesting to hear is just the recognition of how the responsibility to address these issues so that women not only have access, they have meaningful access, they're content creators, they're designing and developing algorithms and all of that. That responsibility is going to fall on a number of different actors, and it does. Um, and there, to be specific, there were some examples of human rights impact assessments for platforms or um, leaders taking a, a role in, you know, committing to having a certain number of women um, in positions of power. Um, and grassroots campaigns, um, and then we heard a little bit about what Facebook is doing. Um, also regulatory responses, the Council of Europe, for example, I know that that's very specific, but you can, perhaps there's something that can be drawn from there and for other regions. So I think there's, there are a lot of things that we can take away, um, and I hope that this conversation uh, w will continue um, afterwards. And just I just want to... Just one thing. Please, yeah, uh, take some time uh, for you. The fact that this question of gender gap uh, in the science and tech environment is intimately linked to the, 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 the question of harassment online mm -hmm. and physical harassment. I think it was striking on the, the various uh, testimony we had, we had today. Absolutely. Um, so I'm sorry we couldn't take all the questions, but I think that just um, shows how interesting the conversation was and how engaging it was, well, hopefully, for all of you. Um, and so I'd like to thank all the panelists and also all of you for your participation. A quick round of applause for you. Thank you.